G'day gamers, today I'm going to uh, do a video on Rangers in Neverwinter Nights 2. As you can see here we've got the game up. A um, little bit different from the Rangers in Neverwinter Nights 1, so I'm going to go through that and uh, show you the build that I prefer, and it's probably a little bit strange. So the pros and cons of Rangers in Neverwinter Nights 2. Again, it's a combat fighter based um, class so you'd be expecting to deal damage. Um, a little bit different from Neverwinter Nights 1 you can choose to either be a dual wielding or an archery ranger and you get feats appropriate for that. So you don't automatically get the dual wielding You, if you choose to you can be dual wielding or you can be archery where you will not get those dual wielding feats for free. So that's actually a pretty big change um, you still get your favorite enemies and that makes you very powerful um, you've still got stealth if you want to use it you've still got your animal companion uh, you now get it at level 4 not level 6 so you get it sooner which is a big advantage um, you have less choices of companions but it's not a big deal you still get your druid and clerical spells that you had in the past um, although some of those spells aren't quite as useful as they were and you get more skill points than you did in Neverwinter Nights 1. Um, the disadvantages, again, you get less feats than a fighter, so you're not going to be the uh, huge two-handed sword wielding guy that you were if you were a fighter in Neverwinter Nights 1. Um, you have less hit points than you did in Neverwinter Nights 1. You only have 1d8 rather than 1d10, um, but there are ways around this. You just give yourself a bit more constitution, really. Um, again, since you're not a full fighter, you don't get weapon specialization, so you're not going to be able to do extra damage. Um, you'll have to rely on your favorite enemies and crits and things like that to do your extra damage. You're restricted to light armor and a little bit more restricted than you were in Neverwinter Nights 1. In Neverwinter Nights 1, if you chose to use the archery skills and not really use your dual wielding at all, then you could wear medium armor without any if ill effect at all. Um, you just couldn't use your dual wielding or your stealth. Um, in Neverwinter Nights two here you have to use light armor you still can use medium armor if you decide to but you lose all of those abilities you can't use any of your dual wielding or archery feats depending on which of those uh, combat styles you choose and you can't use any of your stealth uh, so light armor will be your only option uh, effectively you some of the druidic and clerical spells are less effective than they used to be uh, in particular, the summon animal, any of the summon animal spells that you used to use, uh, their duration is way shorter now than they used to be. Um, generally, they will last for the, the duration of an average fight, and then they will disappear. Whereas in Neverwinter Nights 1, you could summon an animal after you rested, and it would, unless it died or you dispelled it, it would still be there the next time you rested. Uh, it would disappear, essentially, next time you rested. So you have to use your summons a lot more carefully if you're going to use that. Um, that was a tactic that I used to use in Neverwinter Nights 1 until I got my animal companion, is I would summon an animal and use that as an animal companion. Um, it's less effective as that early on. So there's still three types of builds that you're going to want to do. You're going to want to do your if you're doing the dual wielding fighting style, you can still do a strength melee or a dexterity melee build. Uh, and then of course you've got your archery fighting style. I'm actually going to talk about pretty well all of this in this video, hopefully. Um, but I'm going to, we'll start, we'll go into the, and we'll go to the official campaign here. And I'm going to show you my recommended build and it's going to be a little bit strange. So most people would normally say that the best race to use for a ranger would be elves or humans. And in Neverwinter Nights 2, you also have the Yanti Pureblood who actually have uh, their favorite class as ranger and they get plus two to dexterity and 
thing and plus two to intelligence which gives you more skills so they actually and they have spell like abilities that are useful for rangers um, they do have the level adjustment of plus two which makes them you know, much harder to level up initially but you know those are the standards that everyone says um, and as I've said in previous videos you get some advantage playing halflings and gnomes as rangers but the big disadvantage is that you can't use any of the larger weapons um, so you can't even use longbows for example if you're going to go archery style or you know the largest weapon that you can use if you're going to go dual wielding will be short swords and they are the equivalent of long swords to gnomes and halflings so it turns out in my opinion the best race to use is not human or elf or yanti pure blood but dwarf i know this sounds strange but i'll i'll my reasons are the following so when we look at the dwarf they get plus two constitution straight away so that gives you one extra uh hit point meaning that you're no longer 1d9 per level sorry 1d8 per level you're one you know 1d8 plus one or essentially nine hit points per level it means it's much easier for you to get to the same 10 hit points per level that you had in Neverwinter Nights 1 and it just makes you that little bit more survivable. Then um, depending on and, and so also uh, along with that as a ranger you get the toughness feat at level 3 as a bonus so that gives you one more hit point per level so right now as a dwarf I'm already at as soon as I get to level 3, I'm at 10 hit points per level, and toughness works retroactively, so I would immediately be at 30 hit points rather than the uh, 26 or um, 24 or whatever it would be normally. Sorry, math is not my uh, greatest skill. Um, 24, yes. So that's the constitution. Then, as a dwarf, you get a bunch of other skills. So this is common to all dwarves. You get a plus two search, plus two bonus to search when uh, searching inside. So that is good search is a skill that, that rangers have and that works well. The lore is not so useful if you're not worrying about using lore, but if you are, that's great. You've got hardiness versus poisons and spells. And that's most of these Dwarven subtypes have that. The, the Shield Dwarves and the Gold Dwarves both have that. Um, Grey Dwarves are a little different. They have immunity to a few different types of... So they're immunity to all poisons. So they don't just have a uh, plus two save. They are immune to poison. And they're also immune to phantasms and paralysis. But they still have the hardiness versus spells as well. So, But you have the, the disadvantage with Grey Dwarves that you have the plus one level adjustment so you level much slower and you know in the at least in the official campaign grey dwarves are one of the bad guys so whether you want to play the same races is, is uh, debatable um, your dwarves also get a plus one racial bonus to attack orcs and goblinoids for shield or um, gold dwarves and it's aberrations for sorry shield or gray dwarves have this one and aberrations so you get a plus one to aberrations as a gold dwarf so that is a good that works well with your favorite enemies if you pick a favorite enemy as orcs or goblinoids as a shield dwarf for example you're going to do even more damage against them you also have the plus four dodge armor class bonus against giants and giant type creatures so ogres trolls and hill giants that works in really well as well in particular ogres because if you uh, goblinoids are included in ogres uh, include ogres normally um, so you get a bit of a uh, an armor class bonus there as well so you're basically taking this ability these abilities here where you have increased combat abilities against certain types of creatures and you can further enhance that by using those creatures as your favorite enemies so that works really really well 
And then finally, you get the weapon familiarity that you can use a Dwarven War Axe as a martial weapon rather than as exotic weapon. So you don't need to learn exotic weapons to use the Dwarven War Axe. And that's good because the Dwarven War Axe is a 1d10 single-handed weapon rather than all of the other single-handed weapons that are 1d8. Um, so that gives you a good weapon that you can use if you're going to dual wield. Um, dual wielding two 1d10 weapons is better than 1d8s. Uh, the Dwarven War Axe doesn't have the high crit range that a lot of other weapons do. It only crits on a 20, so you're definitely going to want to get your crit um, stats increased with feats, and if you can, find some um, find some keen Dwarven War Axes. But I believe that this is a pretty good character class that you can use. And in reality, even if you decide not to dual wield and go down the archery route, uh, shield dwarves are perfectly acceptable as an archery ranger as well, because you're still getting these bonuses against orcs and goblins. You don't have any penalties on dexterity. You do as a gold dwarf, but a grey dwarf and a shield dwarf has no penalties on dexterity, so you're still going to be able to do... You know, have a, have a high dex, and you're going to be able to use longbows. You're not restricted in the weapons that you can use. Um, so you're going to create a pretty effective ranger as a dwarf, but very effective if you want to go the dual wielding uh, weapon type. So let's continue this build. I'm going to go as a shield dwarf. Let's continue this build and see what we come. I'm not going to bother changing how I look. That's fine. Hello. Next. There we go. So we're going to pick our ranger. Oh, let's just go back quickly and go through the the info about a ranger. So 1d8 for hit dice. A little disappointing that that dropped down. I do know that uh, in the 5th edition rules later on that goes back to 1d10 again, which is good. Um, you only actually get armor proficiency in light armor, so you don't have to worry. You just can't use medium armor anymore. Um, you get 6 rather than 4 plus your int modifier for initial um, skill points and times four per level. So you're getting, basically, you by default, you can pick two more skills than what you could previously if you're going to dump all four points into them initially. Um, the skills that you have by default are pretty similar. I'll go through those in a minute. This track ability can be useful. It look, If you don't find it useful, don't put any stats into survival. Don't put any points into the survival skill. But I, I have found it useful when I have played. I haven't finished any of the modules in here. I've only played the official mo the official campaign and I haven't finished it yet. I only got sort of most of the way through Chapter 1. So, um, you know, it might turn out that I find it's pretty useless by the end. Your favourite enemies you've still got, that's always good. So, plus one bonus to bluff, plus one bonus to weapon damage, um and that bonus increases as you gain levels and you get more of these favorite enemies. And at second level you can choose one of your two combat styles, either the archery style which gives you rapid shot and then later on you get um, many shot and one shot I believe the skills are, um, an improved rapid shot and the two weapon fighting feat gives you two weapon fighting and the various improvements to that. At third level, you get toughness, which is helping to offset the decrease in hit points, I guess. Uh, your animal companion comes earlier at fourth level. You get your spells starting at fourth level. Um, and this is just talking here about the many shot and other feats, feats that you get uh, as your levels go up in your combat styles. Woodland stride, you can start to move quicker during... Uh, woodland environments. I would actually like to see that change to the... I mean, I know this, I, I think, existed in the um, in the desktop game, but really, you should be able to choose which environment you want to gain your um, proficiency in movement in, because not all rangers have to live in the woods. Um, Swift Tracker uh, at 8th level 
um, that allows the tracking skill to, basically your tracking skill then just gets turned on all the time you don't have to turn it on normally when you turn it on you slow down um, but you can see where everything is on the minimap at level 8 you don't have to turn it on anymore it's just always on um, evasion at level 9 so this is also a good guide about skills not to take because you're not going to need them combat mastery so this is the um, improved rapid shot and greater two weapon fighting are the skills that you get there as part of your weapon feat, your um, fighting feats. And at level 13, you get camouflage. Again, this should be in a, a designated uh, area rather than just outdoors. Um, and then hide in plain sight at level 17. I don't know if you get to level 17 in this campaign or not, but that's the, the range of run through. I'm going to choose neutral good again actually no I'll choose chaotic good this time it doesn't really matter although the official campaign in here does um, does keep track of your choices and, and that does affect your uh, alignment but it won't stop you from being a ranger um, your choice of deity doesn't really matter as a ranger um, you're not limited to the favored weapons for example you don't get any bonuses from those if you choose um, different classes you do get some of those I tend, as a dwarf, to want to pick either this one here, uh, Martha Moadorn, um, or I go for the human, because that's a dwarven god, or I go for the human uh, rangers of the north and tracking one, um, Gwaira and Winstrom. Um, okay, so, abilities. I'm going to go from the bottom to the top again. Um, I'm going to point out when we get up to the top here the differences that you'll do for your different builds. Charisma, don't touch it. It's Again, it's a dump stat. A dump, a dump stat. Leave it as it is. Don't worry about it. Wisdom, um, you're going to leave it at 11 and any points you've got left over put in it. Um, unless you really want to get all the spells. But again, I don't find the spells all that useful. And I tend to forget to use them more often than not. So, not going to touch them. Intelligence, put it to 10 so that you don't lose skills. Constitution, we're going to want this to be um, at least 12. If we leave it at 12, then we will get the extra uh, two hit points to make us 1d10 per level, 10 points per level uh, at level 3. You could go to 14 if you want and you'll get 11 hit points a level. Um, so I'm going to leave that there for the moment. Strength and dexterity. Depends on the build that you're doing. Um, if you're going to do a strength-based build, then you'll want to have your strength at 18 and your dexterity at 14. You'll see we've got one point left over, so we'll put that into wisdom. If you want to do a dex-based build or an archery build, just swap them around and go for dex of 14 and strength of, of a dex of 18 and strength of 14. It means you're going to carry a little less and I guess you could drop your um, constitution back to 12 and bump your strength up to 15 which would give you a little bit more carrying capacity if you wanted um, but I don't see that as being a huge advantage. I'm going to build a strength based dwarf here um, so that I'm going to go with that. Backgrounds. This is really... Uh, it, de it does depend a little bit on the playing style that you want. Some of the options that I would point out. Farmer is useful if you want your survival and spot skills to increase. So that's a pretty good option for those. Um, you're going to lose out on lore. Depends on whether you plan to pick that or not. Um, Bully is going to give you Intimidate and Fortitude saves at the expense of Bluff and Diplomacy, but you don't have any of those um, skills available to you by default anyway, so you're not going to be able to level them very well no matter what. Um, Devout gives you an extra Will save and extra Concentration at the cost of uh, Diplomacy and Bluff, but... I don't use concentration anyway. I uh, cast spells outside of battle, not in, so I don't see that being a big one. Militia is useful if you want to use the parry skill. Consider taking militia. And we are going to put parry in this one, so that was that's an option that we might pick. Um, troublemaker, 
yeah, you're not really getting anything useful. Set traps, it, it's nice if you're going to use them, but I don't use traps. Uh, sleight of hand, we can't use because it's not one of our class skills. We get a bonus to reflect save, but we lose that on our will save. Yeah, not that useful. Wild child, you get an a, advantage to survival and tumble, but we don't get tumble as a class skill. You get an advantage to hide and move silently, but again, I'm not going to use those. We get disadvantages to lore and appraise. So it might be a good one if you... It does use a lot... It does give you a lot of the um, range of skills if you're going to use them. Um, foreigner is good if you want lore at the cost of diplomacy. And veteran is... You know, sort of okay if you want fortitude over diplomacy, but I, I would never really pick that one. I'm actually going to pick militia in this case. It's a little bit of a strange one because I don't know how often I'm actually going to use parry. I don't find it that useful a skill, but I've got to use up the skill points. So I've said previously here, I, I never just pick one of these and go next. I always customize them. And I've said in the Neverwinter Nights 1 that I often will pick something that I like the sound of, like Stalker is what, or Default Ranger, but Default Ranger looks funny, and then go customize, because once you then look at your character info, it does say which of these you actually picked. And I don't like it to always say Default Ranger. You know, if I'm going to be an archer, I like to see Marksman, for example, or if I'm going to use this Ranger for an Arcane Archer, I like it to see that. So if you pick this first, and say Stalker, for example, and then go customize, you trick the system into displaying that type, but you've actually customized it to be what you want. Um, just quickly going through the, the craft skills. Concentration, not worth it. All it does is help you to uh, cast spells in combat, which we're not going to do. Craft alchemy, uh, not going to use it. Craft armor, not going to use it. Craft wap, trap, not going to use it. Craft weapon, not going to use it. Um, heal. Heal is useful, but I tend to find potions work better in general. Heal doesn't work all that well in combat, um, and potions do, and that's the time when you really need it the most. So I'm not going to. And heal works fine outside of combat without the extra bonuses. So I'm not going to worry about it. Um, hide, as as with in Neverwinter Nights one, you don't get any bonuses to attack if you attack from stealth. All it will allow you to do is potentially stealth around and see what is, you know, coming up ahead of you and then come back to your main party and uh, plan what you're going to do. I don't see a huge advantage in that, so I don't use it. If it was to give you a bonus to hit on your first attack from stealth, I would use it, and I would put points into it every single time. Um, so I don't recommend that. Listen, definitely want points in listen. Um, helps you to detect opponents early. Law, um, we're going to put points in it because we've got the points to spare, basically. So uh, it just means you can detect uh, a lot of your magical items without having to go back to town first or give it to one of your spellcasters. Move silently, again with hide, limited use because it doesn't give you any bonus to attack. Um, parry, as I've said before, parry is a okay skill if you're prepared to spend the time to use it properly. Um, I'm going to add it to this because I've got the spare points, but I don't know how often I'll use it in this build. Um, you, you really have to pay attention and be willing to turn it on and off as needed because when you turn on parry, the only way that you attack your opponent is to repost on a successful parry. Um, so if your opponent is not actually attacking you, you won't have any successful parries and therefore you will stand there and look stupid. Um, so be aware of that. Search is definitely a useful skill, so I'm definitely putting points in that. Set trap. I never seem to get traps to work properly, so I don't bother with it. But if you can make them work, then they are probably useful and I would put points into it, maybe take it out of parry or law, for example. Spot allows you to see opponents early and also allow you to see if they're hidden or invisible, so take it, it is useful. And again, survival allows you to detect creatures. 
um, around on the map. So, and opponents, you know, hostile creatures, everything basically. So, uh, if you want that ability, and eventually you'll get that without having to turn it on, it just happens, and put your points into to that. And that uses up all of our points. As a human, you'll get one more set of points. So, as a human, you could use set traps, for example, if you wanted to, or you could not take parry and you could take hide and move silently, um, or you could put points into heal, or whatever else you want. Um, so that's skills. Bonus feats. Our Which favorite enemy do we choose? Okay, so as a dwarf, First of all, it's very dependent on the module that you're playing. Um, you can pick some things which are fer fairly generic. I've yet to see a module that didn't have some undead in it somewhere. Um, and a lot of modules are heavily on the undead. So if you're unsure, you can pick that one. Um, and there are other things that are useful to pick. As a dwarf, picking orcs or goblinoids would be a very good choice. Um, or giants as well. In this module, in the official campaign, I know that your main enemy, the Githyanki, are considered outsiders. So I'm going to pick that as my first choice, but I am definitely going to pick Goblinoids and Orcs as my next two choices. Um, there are some undead in that adventure, but I want to maximize this as a dwarf, and so that's what I'm going to, to set up. So that was our bonus feats. Our normal feat, we only get one here. Um, this now depends on which sort of ranger I'm playing. So we know I'm playing a strength-based ranger here, so my options are I should be picking power attack first, which will give me the ability to pick cleave later, and then I should pick weapon focus in my weapon of choice, which, you know, as a dwarf should probably be dwarven war axe, although I'll talk about the option for this campaign in a minute. And then, um, after I've picked Dwarven War Axe, I should pick Power Critical and then Improved Critical in Dwarven War Axe. Power Critical allows me to get a higher threat confirmation roll, because when you do a crit, you, you roll normally, you get a 20, for example, so you've critted. You then have to roll again, and that is your confirmation roll. So what Power Critical does is improves your confirmation roll by, by four, so that you're more likely to confirm your critical hit, and then once you've confirmed it, you do your damage. So we get Power Critical first, and then we do Improve Critical, and Improve Critical says that your critical range on your weapon doubles. So if you normally have a critical of 20, which is just on one, it would be 19 or 20. Or if you had 19 to 20, it would suddenly be 17 to 20. Uh, etc. Um, so those are the those are the feats that I recommend as a strength based ranger. Melee based ranger is going to be exactly the same, except you're going to want to take weapon finesse first, so that you can use your dexterity to use for your hit bonus on or your your hit chance on um, all of these weapons: dagger, hand axe, karma, kukri, light hammer, mace, rapier, short sword, sickle, whip. And unarmed. So you're going to either dual wield rapiers or short swords. Um, you can do rapier and short sword or rapier and dagger or short sword and dagger if you want or you can mix it up and do things like rapier and mace if you want to do piercing and bludgeoning and all those sorts of things but you got to remember that if you want to get weapon focus, power critical and improve critical in those weapons that's going to be six feats rather than three if you're using two different weapons. So I recommend, even though it can be, it can put a penalty on your, your hit, it's only a two point penalty, use the same weapon in each hand. You just, it's better for dual wielding. So you're going to want weapon finesse first, then you can do power attack and cleave and weapon focus. You might want to leave cleave off, I don't recommend it, but you might want to leave cleave off so that you can get weapon focus, power critical and proof critical sooner, and then put cleave afterwards. But I find cleave as early as possible is good because you want that skill. It is very, very useful. And later on, if you want, you can take power critical, uh, sorry, improved cleave, I think it is, or greater cleave. Um, and then you can start looking at things like dodge and stuff like that. But also, go back to the 
Ranger details and find out all of those feats that you get automatically. So for example, don't take toughness, you're going to get it automatically. Don't take two weapon, uh, I can't take two weapon because my dex isn't high enough, but don't take two weapon fighting or any of those skills, you're already going to get them. Don't take improved evasion, you're already going to get it. Um, so just be aware of that. So I'm going to pick power attack here because I'm going to take a uh, strength based ranger. We're going to go to next uh, random names. I'm not really caring about the name here. I'm going to turn off the, the voice and that is going to be my build. I'm going to let this level up to third level as it normally would just to show you that. So many years ago so today. We'll skip past all of this. Uh, the, this. Skip the tutorial and just show you the leveling up to level three um, so that we can see what it looks like and then I will while I'm doing that I'll talk about a couple other things. So animal choices. You're going to get your animal at level four there's still only three main choices here. The bear is good all round, does a lot of damage, can take a few hits. The boar can take a few hits as well, doesn't do as much damage as the bear, but it's it's a good little tank. And the wolf is pretty good as well. The other ones are garbage, in my opinion. You no longer have the hawk or the any village of the is birds. under attack! You don't my have is un Oops. You You're don't safe. have um the dire wolf anymore, which was was better than the normal wolf. Um, you still have the spider for some reason, and you still have the badger, which really isn't very good, um, even though it should be. All I know is that Gale. We better hurry. I saw some of them following. Okay, so let's just level me up. We'll have a look at that. Uh, weapon choices. So, as a dwarf, using a strength-based ranger, you've really only got two options: use the dwarven war axes. Or if you want to go for an even higher crit build, go for scimitars, because scimitars have a higher crit range, uh, they do less damage, they only do 1d6, so you've got to accept that you're going to do less damage, but you're going to crit way, way more. Uh, dwarven war axes will do more damage when they crit, but you're not going to crit anywhere near as often uh, with them, because they only crit on a 20 until you get improved critical. So here we're going to choose our two weapon fighting style. At second level we get two weapon fighting, we get improved two weapon fighting at sixth level, we get greater two weapon fighting at eleventh level, and we don't have to meet any of those requirements. So normally you would need the necessary decks to do that. So that is basically the standard range of the level and that's one. The archery combat style though if we chose that, we would get Rapid Shot at level 2, which you never got. Many Shot, which when you what that does is give you two arrows in the first shot for a round. Um, and then Improved Rapid Shot, which gives you the same as Rapid Shot, but you no longer have the minus two penalty to it. Um, so that's a really good feat. But remember, you lose all of your two weapon fighting if you choose that. So if you're going to choose a backup weapon, it needs to be a single-handed weapon, or you pick a two-handed sword, or something like that. Um, so you need to consider that. Two-weapon fighting. Um, so we've taken that, and then we go to our next level, and all we get is... Um, I don't think we get any bonuses. Oh, no, sorry, level three, we get toughness. So our hit points should end up being 33, 11, uh, one point. We can take our next feat here. We take cleave, um, and so we gained 11 hit points, and we're now at 33 hit points. So armor. I'll talk really quickly on armor. If you're doing a strength-based build like this, the best armor you can get is a chain shirt. Chain shirts are now light armor. They used to be medium in Neverwinter Nights One. Um, they give you four points of armor plus up to four points based on your decks. So you're going to get a total of six points out of that because you've got two here. If you get any items that boost your decks and you can get your decks up to 16, then you'll get the maximum benefit of eight points out of your chain shirt. Don't use chain mail, it's chain shirt. Um, 
if you're not using a strength based build, you're doing a dex based build, either a dex melee or an archery, then you're going to want to pick the armor, the light armor that gives you the best armor as your dex increases. So you'll start with a chain shirt and then you'll probably go to studded leather or hide and then from there you'll go to leather armor and then from there you'll go to padded armor as your dexterity goes up. Because if you, if your dex bonus, if you stayed in a chain shirt for example and your dex bonus was five, it limits you to four. It doesn't limit your ability to, it doesn't limit your attack bonus if you're using a bow, but it will, um, any of your skills that you use that are dex based will be dropped down a little bit because you've lost that bonus. So really pick the armor that works the best for you in that situation. Finally, in this official campaign, the next feat that I'm going to take is not going to be Dwarven War Axe. It's actually going to be Warhammer. And there's a reason for that. In this official campaign, you have a Dwarven companion called Kelgar Iron Fist, and if you follow the quests that he does, you will eventually get the Gauntlets of Iron Fist, which gives you plus 3 to strength and a plus 1 to hit, and it does an extra plus 1d4 of bludgeoning damage. Then you will find the Belt of Iron Fist that gives you a plus 3 to constitution and a plus 1 to save, and then finally you will find the Hammer of Iron Fist, which gives you a whopping plus 6 to strength, that's an additional, so that's giving you a total of plus 9, all up with the, the gauntlets and the hammer. You do an additional plus, the, the weapon is enchanted at plus 4, so that's an extra 4 to hit and 4 to damage. And it does an extra 1d8 of electrical damage. And then it will build up charges every hit. And after you've done between 15 and 1d15 of charges, you can use a lightning blast effect which does 8d6 of damage. So that is a colossal weapon and it can only be used by a dwarf. So if you dual wield that with another warhammer, you are going to do insane amounts of damage and that is my ultimate goal. I'm actually going to stream that in Twitch and I'll put those videos up on YouTube and we'll see how we go. Um, I'm going to recreate this character and call him a slightly different name, but that's what I'm going to be doing over the next uh, weeks um, and see how that character goes. Hopefully I'll finish the adventure with that character, but we'll see. I may get bored with it and decide to do something else in the meantime. So that's my suggestion for a ranger build in Neverwinter Nights 2. I hope you found that helpful. Um, Leave any comments below about your ideas, uh, like the video if you enjoyed it, and happy gaming, I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.